Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, you're very welcome to these uh, Royal Botanic Garden uh, seminars. Um, and before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal uh, of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of this land uh, from which we're broadcasting the seminar, and pay our respects to the elders, uh, both past and present. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. Uh, we're very excited to our have our first uh, international speaker uh, talking to us directly from Scotland, I believe. So Mario Vallero uh, Marin, I'm trying to pronounce your name correctly, <laughs> uh, is originally from Mexico, uh, but is currently an associate professor in evolutionary biology at the University of Stirling. Uh, and before that, he uh, did a PhD at Duke University in the US and postdocs at the University of Toronto. So we have a real international uh, speaker. And so Mario, for those of you who uh, don't know him, um, probably works on many different things, but is a, one of the world uh, most recognized experts on bus pollination. And so today we've invited him to, to talk specifically about the, this um, topic. So we're very excited. Uh, just for, as a reminder, after Mario's uh, seminar, about 30 minutes, you'll have an option to ask questions directly in person or uh, via the chat. So feel free to ask any questions. I'm sure Mario will appreciate. All right, so off to you, Mario. Thank you very much, uh, Hervé, for the introduction and to the Royal Botanic Garden, Sydney, for inviting me and to everybody for, for making it uh, this late in the day to the seminar. Um, before I start, I just want to say that this is a very special seminar for me because I, um, I'm, I was supposed to be you know, with my family doing a sabbatical this semester in Australia. And as everybody knows, uh, uh, plans have changed quite a bit, bit this year. So this is my uh, opportunity uh, to speak to some of you in Australia and tell you a little bit about the work that uh, my lab and I have been doing over the last few years, uh, studying a very special type of pollination called bus pollination. Um, so let me see if I can, yeah. So uh, um, pollination needs little introduction, right? But we all know that flowers display an incredible diversity of forms, colors, shapes, and uh, types, and that Part of this diversity has evolved in response to this close interaction that plants, flowering plants, have with their pollen vectors, be it uh, bats, hummingbirds, uh, uh, wasps, uh, flies, uh, bees, uh, all sorts of invertebrates. Now, the way that these um, that plants um, manage this interaction uh, with their pollinators is by offering uh, different types of rewards. Um, and these, these rewards are, are uh, very diverse. So the most common one is to provision, to provide nectar. And this nectar, the sugary substance, is collected by different types of visitors, uh, many insects, as, as a form of um, fuel um, uh, and food for their, for their offspring. Now, um, about 90% of all flowering plants are animal pollinated, but in addition to nectar, uh, a significant fraction of plant species across more than 160 families provide um, other types of reward, including pollen as the main or the only reward for these pollinators. So pollen forms part of this um, assemblage of different um, attractants that plants offer their pollinators. And Pollen is um, particularly interesting because it serves a dual function um, uh, in the life of the plant. On one hand is this reward to attract pollinators, but on the other hand is also, as you know, the vehicle that transports the gametes that are required for fertilization. So the um, offering of pollen as a reward has given rise to some very interesting um, evolutionary responses from both plants and, and pollinators. And the one I want to talk to you about today is um, a special type of pollination called um, bus pollination. And this is something that you probably have uh, heard before uh, or heard about before. It's a type of pollination that involves uh, uh, mostly or exclusively bees that are collecting these uh, uh, pollen rewards from flowers. But 
um, rather than me trying to uh, describe it with, uh, with words, I think the best way to, to uh, understand what bus pollination is, is to see it in action. So I want to show you a very brief uh, video that was shot by the BBC a couple of years ago uh, that illustrates this, this bus pollination. these vibrations that create the sound of the buzz. And we brought the specialist slow motion camera to reveal just how that buzz can trigger the flower, in this case, a relative of the tomato plant, to release its pollen. Slowed down to around a tenth of normal speed, we can see exactly what's going on. Clasps the flower, vibrates her flight muscles without moving her wings. The vibrations shake pollen out of the stamen where it's stored, and the pollen sticks to her body hairs. She'll comb most of this pollen into baskets on her legs, but the grains which are missed will go on to fertilize one of the next flowers she visits. So um, hopefully this gives you a, a visual idea of what is boss pollination, and also, and also like uh, I hope you were able to hear these um, uh, buses, uh, these high-pitched buses that bees produce while, while um, bus pollinating. So, but, you know, go, going to the, to the basic, what, what is bus pollination? And bus pollination in the literature has different um, definitions. So I want to start by offering you uh, what I think is a, a good working definition for bus pollination. And basically, bus pollination is an interaction between a behavior uh, um, that some insects, specifically bees do, that is the production of vibrations to remove pollen from flowers, and a special type of flowers, uh, sometimes called poricidal flowers, that release pollen more effectively when they are vibrated. So the combination of these two is what gives rise to the, the pollination uh, type or pollination syndrome of bus pollination. So for the remaining of this uh, uh, short talk, what I want to tell you is to, uh, I want to talk to you about three basic questions that I've been studying over the last few years. The first one is why do bees would use uh, vibrations to remove pollen from flowers? The second is how to build a bus pollinated flower. And finally, I want to present you some uh, recent results of our work investigating how does bus pollination actually work? So why, why do bees use vibrations to remove pollen? Well, um, bees vibrate flowers of very many different types. And this is something that you probably have heard uh, in your gardens, if you have the right type of flower and the right type of bee. For example, um, it's common for bumblebees to vibrate um, uh, roses. Other, other bees uh, do it as well, as well as other species with these uh, brush-like uh, flowers, like uh, anemone or um, on that very different type of flower, Melampyrum is also often um, um, vibrated. And um, bees use these vibrations as a way to efficiently uh, and effectively remove large amounts of pollen uh, from these flowers of different uh, morphologies. So the vibrations um, are uh, associated with certain morphologies like these brush-like flowers and others that I will uh, uh, present again. Uh, I mean, uh, later. However, in addition to being just one more tool that bees have to remove pollen, in some cases, um, vibrations are the only way to unlock the pollen grains that are uh, kept inside of special types of anthers. So most flowering plants have this type of anthers that when they are mature, they open laterally or they use laterally or longitudinally and expose the pollen, those orange grains in the screen. Uh, that can be actively or passively collected by the visitor. In other cases, anthers um, um, mature and open in a different way. And on the right-hand side of your screen, you have a, a poricidal uh, anther in which instead of open, opening longitudinally, the uh, anther only releases pollen through small pores at the tip of the, of the stamen that are shown there with the, with the black arrow. So the pollen is only expelled from these small apical pores at the tip of the stamen. And in this type of um, pore anthers or poricidal anthers, vibrations are an effective way to remove pollen. Of course, there are other ways 
in which pollinators can collect pollen. We have here um, a marmalade hoverfly removing um, inefficiently um, a little bit of pollen that is um, uh, that remains at the tip of the of the anther, perhaps because another pollinator visited before. Uh, honeybees have other other techniques to remove pollen from these type of anthers. But by far, the more uh, efficient method to remove this pollen is by vibrating. And these vibrations release a large amount of pollen grains uh, from these types of flowers. Now, um, a couple of years ago, um, Sophie Cardinal, Steve Buchmann, and Avery Russell published an exciting paper documenting the evolutionary history of this bee behavior um, across all, um, all bees and uh, doing a phylogenetic analysis of the capacity to produce vibrations to remove pollen, they estimated that uh, this flower buzzing originated about 100 million or 145 million years ago. It's extremely widespread with approximately 15% of all bee genera being able or containing species that are able to, uh, to vibrate. And this includes uh, more than 50% of all bee species. It's a behavior that has evolved um, multiple times repeatedly and independently, more than 45 times. And it's likely a behavior that has evolved from pre-existing ones. So it's the co-opting of those vibrations that are then employed for a different purpose. In this case, collecting pollen grains. But um, given this um, animal behavior to remove pollen, how do plants build bus pollinated flowers? The most common way uh, to build a bus pollinated flower is by far through the modifications of the anther or the stamen that I was describing before. And on the screen, you have um, at the bottom here the transition from um, a non bus pollinated flower to a bus pollinated flower, where you can see that the um, anthers form a cone at the center of the flower. There are porycidal anthers release pollen from the anther tips and so on. But this is by no means the only way to make a bus pollinated flower, and uh, several species of pedicularis um, have modifications of the corolla tube that become effectively a, a, a pore. The whole um, corolla tube becomes a pore, so the pollen is ejected only from small openings at the tip. And in some extreme cases, um, entire uh, flowers and entire inflorescence can be transformed into poricidal structures, as it happens with, some, with at least one species of Dalechampia from uh, Madagascar in the family Euphorbiaceae. Um, as I was saying, the most common uh, transition to build a bus pollinated flower is by the modification of the, um, of the anthers and the stamens. And you have uh, here a uh, nice example from the Primulaceae um, non bus pollinated flower on the left and a bus pollinator, bus pollinated flower of Primula or the Decatheon uh, on the right. And the structures um, here are the enlarged stamens that are now releasing pollen from um, these pores. Now, porosidal anthers are extremely diverse and occur across many different families. And uh, uh, with together with uh, Steve Bookman and Avery Russell, Rosanna, Senil Ferguson, and, and others, we are uh, um, re-exploring the distribution of porosidal anthers across flowering plants. And I hope to have some results uh, to present uh, you on that later. But we know that this uh, type of porosidal anther, and in particular, uh, the so-called solanum type flower, where the anthers are presented in a cone um, in the middle of the flower, has evolved repeatedly multiple times across many different li uh, lineages of flowering plants. Okay, so we have now um, these two ingredients. The, 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 from the bee perspective, is a behavior that is co-opted and used uh, um, to extract pollen from flowers. From the plant perspective, we have um, repeated transitions to similar uh, functional, functionally similar flower morphologies. Um, and now what I want to do in the remaining of the talk is to tell you how these two things come together and how does bus pollination work. Now, only um, curiously, perhaps, um, only bees have been observed to, to produce vibrations to remove pollen or sonicate, and specifically only female bees. And part of the explanation for that is that pollen grains are uh, the main or uh, sometimes the only source of protein used to feed the larvae. And thus, uh, only uh, females that provision nests have an, uh, 
necessity to, uh, to collect pollen in large quantities. And these uh, vibrations or sonications, as you saw in the video, um, are heard by us in the form of, that, of these uh, high uh, pitch noises. So here you can hear um, a, fly, a bee approaching a flower, those deeper bosses, then landing on the flower and vibrating um, the flower by contracting uh, very rapidly their thoracic muscles while grabbing the flower in a characteristic C shape so that the uh, pores in this case are in the ventral side of the, of the um, pollinator and the pollen that is expelled through these vibrations is then expelled into the, into the belly of the, of the bee. Now, um, a bee vibration or a floral vibration produced by bees um, can be described in a couple of simple um, ways by, um, for example, uh, recording this, this vibration using a, a microphone or other uh, forms of recording. And here you have a, a vibration produced by the bee on the picture over there. And you can see that these bosses correspond, um, are made of short uh, bursts of vibration. Here you can see three of them. And each of those bursts of vibration or pulses um, is composed of vibrations of a, of a characteristic frequency, the number of um, cycles of these vibrations per second. And you can, can characterize these vibrations by their duration, their frequency, and their intensity or their amplitude. Now, as I mentioned before, bees produce vibrations for um, different reasons, and uh, some bees use vibrations to thermoregulate, like this picture, thermal um, camera image in the, in the slide. They also use vibrations for communication, to warn of predators, even to uh, build nests, and obviously for pollen collection. So one of the uh, first, thing, first things that we were interested in since the beginning of this work and uh, up to now is whether all, all these bosses that are produced in different behavioral contexts are the same or are they different? So um, David Pritcher in the photo um, on the top right and I conducted a study, a simple uh, study to try to uh, describe in detail the vibrations produced by the same type of bee, the same individual bee, under different contexts. And for this, we used our experimental workers, um, the buff-tailed bumblebee, Bombus ter uh, terrestris, and a bus-pollinated flower, this uh, yellow flowered solanum, a relative of tomatoes. Um, what David uh, um, uh, did was to design an experiment where we could have an individual, um, and, and we then measured the type of vibrations that it produced. And the experiment was really um, simple, consisted of, uh, for example, tethering a bee to a fixed platform um, and then shining a laser vibrometer that is a, an apparatus that allows you to very uh, precisely measure the type of vibrations produced by the bee without really touching the bee uh, otherwise. So um, by gently squeezing the bee with a pair of tweezers in, in, the, in the legs, you can elicit this bee to produce uh, so-called defense vibrations or um, vibrations that are uh, thought to be used to warn off predators. Then uh, the same tether B um, could be induced to produce flight vibrations by removing the platform where it was resting and this triggers uh, the bee to start uh, flying. And in um, a parallel experiment with the same uh, uh, bee colony, we were also able to induce this bee to produce floral vibrations or um, uh, pollination vibrations that were also measured with the same uh, setup. So we were able to obtain these three different types of vibrations, the fence, flight, and floral pulses on the same bee and measure them in a non-contact form with the laser vibrometer. And this is what we found. On the left-hand side, you have um, each row represents one of the behaviors and the first column represents the vibration um, over time. So you can see that this flight vibration uh, has relatively low amplitude in the y-axis, but it's continuous as, uh, as the insect uh, continuously beat the, uh, the wings. Uh, this vibration is composed of relatively low uh, uh, fundamental frequencies. That's the first peak on the spectrogram uh, that are shown in the second column. 
In contrast, a defense vibration is uh, made of um, um, broken out bursts of vibration of higher amplitude and slightly higher frequencies. And finally, the um, floral vibrations, which are messier to mess because the bees moving all over the place, are also uh, uh, of higher amplitude, in this case velocity, and of a higher uh, frequency. So now presenting you a summary of, of these results in one slide, what we have found is that um, floral vibrations here in green with the letter C have higher peak velocities and higher frequencies than the other types of vibrations. Okay. So this slide um, um, shows clearly, I think, that not all these vibrations are the same. And in fact, floral vibrations seem to be the ones that are, uh, have the higher frequency, the higher velocity. Now, the vibrations produced by, uh, by bees are then applied onto the flower. And bus pollination results from this interaction between the application, the production of these vibrations, their application on the flower and the consequences for pollen release that the vibrations have. Now, we know from first principles that um, uh, the consequence of these vibrations are not the same for different types of bees. For example, uh, two bees that produce a vibration with the same pitch, with the same frequency, say 300 cycles per second, but different sides are likely to be able to reach very different velocities because the larger bee will be able to displace those muscles further and, and therefore achieve higher velocities than the smaller bee. So in, um, um, in another experiment, together with two undergraduates, Blanca and Kate, we were interested at looking at what uh, are the characteristics of vibrations produced by, the, um, by bees of uh, different sizes working on um, uh, related types of flowers. So what uh, Blanca and the rest of the team did was to compare four bumblebee species um, uh, bus pollinating to different types of flowers. Solanum rostratum, the yellow flower, and Solanum uh, citrullifolium, the purple. And in this case, we measured the vibrations, not with a laser, but with a small uh, device, an accelerometer that can be attached uh, to the flower. This is um, uh, just an image to uh, summarize the variation in, in the size of bees of uh, the four species we studied in four different colors, showing you that even within a single colony, you have very different uh, sizes of bees. And uh, what uh, uh, Blanca and the team found was that each of these uh, species of closely related bumblebees produce vibrations of different types. For example, um, the frequency of um, subspecies Audax and subspecies Canariensis is uh, clearly different, and, and so for and so on with the other species. Um, in contrast, the acceleration that these uh, bees can achieve, the, the amplitude, how loud the bus uh, sounds, um, um, is, is less variable. It's different between um, um, subspecies Audax and the rest, but not different among, among the rest of the species, including a Japanese bumblebee, uh, Bumble Sigmatus. So now we know that, um, that there is variation in the vibrations that are produced. We know that this variation um, occurs within species and between species. And my question is, what is the consequence of this variation on pollen release? And this takes me to my first bus pollination paper, the, thing, the study that got me started on this. And it was a study that uh, Paul DeLuca, uh, 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 who uh, came to visit um, our university in Scotland, uh, thanks to the Royal Society, and, uh, and I, along with other colleagues, conducted um, uh, several years ago. And what uh, Paul did was to recreate artificial uh, buses uh, inspired by the type of vibration that we measured on bees, and then apply these synthetic buses on flowers and look at how much pollen comes out. Uh, Paul investigated three main components of the vibrations, the duration, the velocity, and the frequency. And he found, surprisingly, that frequency uh, had no effect on the release of pollen, but perhaps less surprisingly, that both duration and velocity have a, an important effect on how much pollen comes out. In other words, vibrations that are longer or of higher velocity remove the most pollen. So, 
if the type of vibration produced by the bees affects the amount of pollen, one can start uh, wondering about what are strategies plants might employ or display in order to um, um, exploit the different types of vibrations and maybe adjust the amount of pollen that they release upon these vibrations. So in a um, uh, recent um, experiment conducted by uh, Dr. Jureen uh, Kemp, uh, who is a Newton Fellow at the, uh, the University of Stirling, and I, we, we decided to study a group of closely related solanum species, uh, the, the potato and tomato relatives, that display contrasting floral morphologies. So among these six taxa, you have um, three pairs, one member of each pair that has large um, flowers that uh, have this, um, uh, the outcrossing characteristics and a small flower taxon that has the characteristics of a self-pollinating um, uh, flower. And we use these uh, um, evolutionary replicates to investigate how these flowers respond to vibrations and how did they differ in the um, pattern of pollen release upon vibrations. And um, so what Jureen did was to um, uh, recreate the type of experiment that Paul did um, before and um, synthesize uh, bee vibrations that could then be played back to flowers. Uh, Jureen then uh, collected the pollen that came out of the flowers, quantified using a particle counter, and then look at how much pollen proportionally is released on each of uh, 30 consecutive vibrations. And uh, what she found was that the outcrossing taxon, the darker, uh, more shallow line, releases pollen more slowly and less than the selfing taxon here in um, a lighter color. So that in the first vibration, the selfing taxon was releasing uh, up to 60% of the pollen containing the anthers, while the um, uh, outcrossing taxon was releasing about half of that. And so in subsequent uh, vibrations, the disp dispensing rate of pollen upon subsequent vibrations was shallower for the outcrossing rate, for the outcrossing taxon, than for the selfing taxon. In other words, the outcrossing taxon seems to be dosifying pollen more carefully than the selfing taxon, which seems to um, expel that pollen um, uh, quickly upon, upon vibrations. Um, so what about now? Uh, what are the consequences of different types of vibrations on pollen release? So the second set of experiments that you're in did was to um, produce vibrations of different acceleration, high, medium, and low. And what she found was um, effectively uh, what we had found before, that high acceleration or high velocity vibrations are more effective at removing pollen than um, uh, uh, than lower acceleration vibrations. And these effects are more marked for selfing taxa than for, uh, for outcrossing uh, taxa, but they are still present in, in all, all uh, the species that we studied. And the effect occurs not only on how much pollen is re released on the first vibration, but also the rate of release on subsequent vibrations. Um, it, this um, uh, this figure just shows the, the comparison of the, the two components of the pollen release uh, curves, uh, provides statistical support of, uh, for what I, what, I've shown, uh, what I have told you before, at least for some of the taxa pairs that we studied. The exception seems to be um, uh, the white flower taxon. Okay, so um, since I'm uh, running out of time, I just want to quickly summarize what I've shown you today. Um, I have um, shown you um, or told you why do bees use floral vibrations um, in order to improve the pollen collection in um, many different types of flowers and as an unlocking mechanism on specific types of modified uh, poricidal flowers. You have uh, or plants have evolved a variety of ways to produce these bus pollinated flowers by modifying uh, anther corolla or in some cases entire flowers. And this shows, uh, I think, one of the most amazing examples of convergent evolution on functional morphology across flowering plants. And finally, I have uh, shown you a couple of um, handpicked examples 
of the type of work that we're doing in the lab at the moment, trying to get a better understanding on how those bus pollination work. And although bus pollination had been known for more than 100 years, um, and there was a series of seminal uh, papers produced in the uh, late 70s and early 80s on bus pollination and the biomechanics of bus poll pollination, there's still very many uh, exciting questions to investigate about how uh, exactly bees produce vibrations, uh, why some insects don't produce vibrations and others do, and how do they uh, come together with uh, floral adaptations uh, to, uh, to uh, determine the amount of pollen that is released um, in flowers of different types. Okay, now um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, we've published a uh, um, introductory review to this topic. For those of you that are interested in finding out more about bus pollination, there is a three page quick guide to bus pollination in the uh, current issue of current biology. And I put there a QR code if you are interested in accessing the PDF or you can email me and I'll send you a copy. I'll be happy to do that. And um, sorry for running a bit over time, uh, Hervé, but I just want to acknowledge my uh, collaborators, uh, particularly uh, Paul De Luca um, and the people in my lab and my funding sources. And thank you. Thanks so much, Maria. This was uh, fascinating. Um, so, does anyone have a question to ask? I can have a go. Have I? Yeah, go for it. Uh, Mario, so what, what would you, um, you know, you've talked about uh, the evolution of, uh, of the bees 